Uh, okay, so uh, we like to kick things off uh, each each Docker Austin with just a, a quick tip and or trick. Um, and you know, it usually lasts maybe 10 to 15 minutes before we get into the, the main thing. And, and I'd like to remind everyone that like, you're most welcome to provide the tip or trick, like you or, or you or you, um, like go ahead. Uh, if you've, uh, blogged about something or if you've just got some, uh, <laughs> you know, some notes that you want to throw up and, and demo something cool. Go for it. Just let us know. Just contact us through Meetup or, or however you care to contact us and uh, have at it. So I'll, I'll share with you a, a blog post I recently wrote here and do a, a really quick demo. Okay, so this is all about... Uh, the Docker authorization plugin and creating one in Python. So that's a pretty good size here. Okay, so obviously not going to read all of this. Um, what I what I do want to show you is or, or get across the basic point of the the Docker authorization plugin is it's a, it's a way to hook into the the request and response lifecycle of the Docker engine, and it's really best illustrated um, with this diagram here. Um, so you're able to essentially intercept the request uh, that goes you know, through the daemon, from the client through the daemon. It gets passed to your authorization plugin. So this thing's useful for like any number of, of use cases. If you want to deny access uh, to some uh, particular path on hosts, if you don't want people mounting just to anywhere on the host, or uh, if you want to do, you could actually do authentication with this thing as well. You could be checking usernames and, and some sort of token or API key or password for actually um, authing people, even though it's not specifically built for that. Uh, and, and any number of other things. One of the things we use it for on Karina is to kind of massage the error messages that we return to users. Because some of the stuff that uh, Docker Engine throws back can be pretty unfriendly. It's just like, if you deny the user access to some resource or some mount path, it's just like, oh, 500. And like, sorry, you're out of luck. You can't do this thing. Or it looks like a server error to the user, right? And that's not really what it is. They're trying to do something that we're denying access to. So we can give a better error message back and actually you know, give them a URL so they can remediate the issue. So you're able to intercept the, the request that's actually flowing through the daemon. It sends a request to your own authorization plugin and I'll show you how it does that. So you're actually processing a request of a request and, and I'll show you how that happens uh, within the code. And then you can either allow that request um, or this, this deny scenario where you deny the request and say, okay, um, stop it. You don't have access to this resource or, or what have you. Any quick questions on that? Does it kind of clear what it does and what it's for? So showing the, uh, the deny workflow here. So it's, it's a matter of when, when the request flows through to your plugin, you check some sort of business rule that you have and you actually just, uh, the main thing is you return a, a simple Boolean and a, a JSON payload uh, saying, you know, uh, uh, well, we'll see it in a moment, but like false, essentially, and providing uh, what's hopefully a descriptive error message. So is there an analog for like the authentication flow as well? Uh, this one's very much authorization. Right. So the, the question was, is there an analog for the authentication flow? This is very much authorization based. So not currently. Uh, this is basically just an authorization plugin. In fact, I mean, it's even a little more generic than that. It's just a request response plugin. You could effectively call it, they called it an authorization plugin because you're, the idea is typically that you're going to be uh, doing some sort of authorization and, and denying access on some rules to, to certain resources, but they don't have like a, strictly a authentication plugin for the Docker engine yet. You could. Do you mean like the the certificates you're passing and stuff? 
I would hope not. Um, Yeah, it, it would have to be, the, the engine would have to provide that facility to you. That's right, yeah. And, and as, as far as I'm aware, it's not yet, although I haven't like sussed out every single little detail of what, what you can do currently with this. Okay, so let's, uh, let's dive right in and, and get into a demo. I'm using Docker, uh, I'm using Python to write this plugin. Typically, uh, these sorts of plugins are written in Go, but I just picked Python actually just kind of as like, uh, oh, how would I do this if I wanted to do it in Python? Um, using Flask for the web framework, it's the, the protocol with the plugin is HTTP. Um, and that can run over, uh, you know, you can, you can run it on a, a TCP endpoint or you can run it with a Unix socket. So to get, uh, to get an environment to do your development here, uh, you create a boot to Docker uh, virtual machine with Docker machine, but I've already got one up and running, of course. Um, bigger, here we go. Okay, so so now I've, I've SSH'd into my Docker machine, uh, and this is really just a, a proof of concept, so I didn't work out all the little permissions and everything uh, that you would need to, to run it in a, a production environment. Uh, so just like root all the things. Okay, so because boot to Docker is, is based on tiny core Linux, it actually doesn't ship with Python. Uh, so you gotta go ahead and use this TCE load, you know, kind of their, their analog of apt-get and, and install Python, which is, it's already on there. And then you go ahead and you install pip uh, for, for your package manager. Uh, because I'm running this thing directly on the host as opposed to, you know, like running it as a container or something else. It's running uh, directly on the host uh, just so it's as fast as possible, really. Um, and also much more secure uh, as well. So then, um, you know, just to make things a little easier for the blog post for, for someone who's, who's working through it, I put my code uh, in GitHub and you can go ahead and clone it you know, hop into the directory, uh, you know, here we are, and then run this script to install it. And, and here's that script. And basically all we're doing is we're modifying the, the boot to Docker profile to add this command line flag when the Docker engine boots up, when the Docker engine starts, uh, you pass in this flag and this tells the engine where to find your plugin. This is actually the name, winds up being the name of the socket um, that, that we're listening on for the plugin. Uh, I'm just using a, a, a flat file, a text file for our data store, and I'm just writing uh, false to it. Then we go ahead and install all the requirements for the plugin, and those look like, that's the app code. Basically, what I what I outlined in, the, in those bullet points. Uh, so, actually, one of the more interesting aspects of of doing it this way with Python was the need for uh, a Wisgi uh, server, uh, and I, I chose uWisgi because uh, I've been working with that recently, and I wanted to learn a bit more about it and, and how to configure it and such. Um, so, you know. You, you can figure it with the name of the, the module, which is you know, just my, my Python file, um, auth z. I've been in the States long enough that I'm calling stuff z now. It's auth z, sorry. Um, so it's, it's the master process. I'm only running one process. Um, you, you could run you know, as however many processes you want to be, to be processing these requests. Um, write the PID file out. That's actually just for, for ease of being able to reload the process when you're doing your, your development. Uh, we're doing HTTP, uh, but we're listening on this socket here. And kind of the key part is actually the name uh, of the socket, and that has to correspond to this, uh, the value you pass into the, the plugin flag. Um, I can't actually remember what vacuum equals true does, <laughs> And when you when you shut down uh, uWSGI, that it'll terminate all its all its uh, fork processes, all of its children processes. And of course, we want to be logging. Uh, 
So I'm going to, and then, you know, oh, here's where the logs are, and you can find out how things are actually going as you're doing your development. I'm going to skip that part. Um, if you want to test that your, your plugin is running, just as like, this is how, this is what I did to see that like things were actually working in the first place, um, you know, rather than trying to connect it to uh, the engine right away. Uh, it's kind of hard to see there, but that particular call returns that string. Uh, this next example is a, a little more clear. Uh, and this is actually part of the, the protocol uh, that, that the Docker engine defines. So when you call to this, this slash plugin activate endpoint, you know, you need to return what plugin type you're implementing. Okay, so now uh, getting kind of to the, the meat of it here, we're gonna go ahead and attempt to run a simple container and just echo out a message. Oh, but we get this error response, because uh, of this ridiculous business rule. Uh, and then this is uh, boilerplate Docker engine stuff, uh, not terribly helpful. Um, but then this is what I included in my code. The request auth authorization failed. You must say hello first. Well, okay, it's a little, a little cryptic, um, you know, but that's software. So we go ahead and we say hello. And what effectively that does is write a value to that, that text file that uh, we had installed with our script earlier. So now that we've said hello, we should be able to run our other Docker image. Now we can do whatever we want with this Docker engine because we satisfied some little business rule, you know, that that was coded into the plugin. So it's just a way of providing that kind of that access control and, and authorization. Uh, so what else is sort of interesting? Yeah, so you know, if when when you're actually changing the Python code, being able to reload UISGI easily is is really key. So uh, being able to do that is is very necessary. Uh, and then just a super quick look at the code. So just just a very basic, you know, one one module flask gap. Uh, the the business rules that actually check the for uh, the value in that that flat text file. So the one thing that's here's here's what's returning that that plugin dot activate endpoint. Um, one of the interesting things that I kind of stumbled across that actually wasn't in the docs um, was the fact that when when it when the uh, Docker daemon passes you the request, so you're getting a request of a request. You've got the client request, and then you've got the request from the daemon to your plugin request and a request. And the way it does that, which is pretty sensible, is uh, in in the JSON payload that the daemon is passing you, uh, it base sixty four encodes the request from the client. So it's it's simply just a matter of um, decoding decoding that request and then decoding the, the JSON that actually makes up that request and then you're able to, to work with it. Here's, here's where you decode the, the JSON here. So now I've got it in a dictionary and I can work with it a little easier in Python. And you know, this is just one of the fields. This is the image that uh, the user is actually trying to run. Uh, and you know, I'm looking for the hello world image uh, and you can, inspect any uh, aspect of that request coming from the client and, and do whatever you want with it really. So I don't know, it's, I, I really like the concept. It's a simple concept and it's something that I'm like always looking for whenever somebody gives me a, a framework or something. I'm like, where are the hooks? Show me the hooks. Where, where can I insert my code into the life cycle of your thingy, thingy madui? Because we always want to uh, customize the software. We always want to be able to make it do what we want with kind of a, uh, uh, a sensible way of hooking into the framework. Uh, so that's kind of what appeals to me about this sort of thing and, and interests me about this sort of thing. Uh, and then the response, you can also manipulate the response, but most of the time there, there isn't a real need to do that. Um, although it is a, a good place to improve error messages coming out of, out of the daemon, maybe particular to your environment. So that is a, uh, pretty much everything. You can kind of dream up use cases from there and, and take it forward from there. Thanks.